Okay. I'm also going to do a speaker view. You guys are a little distracting. So, Guruaj, as I said, has a very profound and very personal. I was spending some time on uh, approach to mantra, and I was on the internet trying to find analogs, like where did he come up with some of this stuff? And lots of different, subtly kind of conflicting notions on how to use mantras and wh what mantras are about. I might refer to some of them while reading this. But as far as I can tell, Guruaj's is quite unique. I didn't find anybody else sort of teaching it just the way Guruaj does. But the way he talks about mantra, uh, I was, is difficult for me to really get my head around. It's very subtle. And today, uh, in, while I was contemplating this, especially today during my morning meditation, some things started getting very clear to me. It was like what he meant by mantra, what he means by vibration, and what he means by consciousness. So I'm going to go in and just start reading it. This is a fairly early one, and it's from the UK. It's not an, an AMS that saying, it's from the UK. And uh, thank you, Phil was able to provide me the text for this. It's a combination of statements he was making uh, twice, two different sat sayings combined a little bit towards the end. And finally, as everybody knows, early in Guruaj's teaching mission, he was a little bit more procedural, a little bit more technique oriented. Towards the end, he got quite mystical. And I love the late sat sayings but I'm spending some time going some of these satsangs now, just talking about some of the specifics of what he was doing with his spiritual teachings. So here he is starting out. This was during a rapid fire when people were asking him lots of questions and somebody asked him about mantra. So he says, last night I was asked to speak on mantra, how a mantra is derived, what's the purpose of a mantra, and how does it work on the system generally? I have given many explanations of the deeper details of the vast range of consciousness from which a mantra comes. And that is what we are going to speak about this morning. And you've heard me, me say this many times that I think his talks are amazing, that he could just come up with these things extemporaneously. extemporaneously. Uh, because that very succinctly, I'll repeat it, many explanations of the deeper details of the vast range of consciousness from which a mantra comes. So he's already talking about, that's his thesis in a nutshell, is where does the mantra come from? And what, that's what he was gonna talk about. So he says, now he's gonna dis uh, TM a little bit, so prepare yourself, Transcendental Meditation. There are organizations of people who select mantras, or you're gonna see a cat in a moment go by. There are organizations of people who select, select mantras at random. These selections can be quite jarring to a person's nervous system to their physiology, their biology, and their psychic makeup. It could prove to be a great impediment to the reaching of the totality of themselves, the spiritual self of themselves. That's Guru Raj. That's the purpose of our spiritual practices. Great impediment to the reaching of the totality of ourselves, the spiritual self of our, themselves. This whole satsang is going to be about, what does he mean by that? If these things are wrong and the proper sound basis is not used, then it could manifest, manifest itself physiologically and organically. When you speak about these things to some organizations, they say that you're just pushing away stress. But this doesn't really explain much. For if a mantra is not harmonious or is not given according to your own system, then it would be like you listening to a beautiful symphonic concert while somebody was shooting off fireworks. Your system would be jarred and shaken, and this could be very harmful. I've taught many people meditation, and they've come to me in a terrible state, but out of the thousands of people that we've initiated, I've never had any complaints of a mantra not being suitable. He says that, you know, an improper use of mantra can hurt you. Um, by the way, is that significant? You're darn tootin' it is. Uh, uh, there's a local kirtan group I used to go to, and a very sweet guy always liked to be the spiritual teacher. Uh, the actual spiritual guy was a devotee of Sri Shinoi, but he was, uh, this particular guy was a local musician and practitioner, and he was told this by somebody, and he just said, you know, mantras, he said, just 
Find it and choose any, everything's a mantra. Just choose a mantra you like and do it. Guruaj is saying, actually, that's not the case at all. It's quite wrong. So he goes on, Guruaj goes on. So what's the mechanics of selecting a mantra? I've heard stories that some people just give you half a dozen mantras and say, look, pick one and choose which one you like. I've even heard of stories of people that give you a mantra and say, look, if you don't like it, just come back in two weeks and we'll change it. All these kinds of things, be they true or not true, are not my business. Let people do whatever they want. And if they want to knock their heads against the wall, that's their business. But if their head gets painful, well, then you can come to me. I'll massage your head, and I'll put some balm on it and try to heal it. That's my dharma. A person's consciousness of his or her mind has a very vast range that extends not only to this little head of yours, but is closely connected and is part and parcel of the entire range of mind. The entire range of the mind is as vast as the universe. Is the universe separate from mind? No, the mind is the universe. The mind being a manifestation of the manifestor. Okay, do you remember? This is crucial to Garaj's teachings. The manifestation, this apparent world we live in, and the manifestor, all right? The energy of which this is uh, a vision of. The mind being a manifestation of the manifestor is closely connected to the manifestor. Divinity is permeating this entire range of what we call consciousness. But each person in his or her evolutionary progress is at a different stage of evolution. There are some people like horses in a race who might be running neck and neck, but there are very few saying very few of us are in a similar configuration. Most people are at a particular stage in evolution, and because they are at a particular stage, every person is unique. This uniqueness is because of their own individual samskaras on the path of evolution. This is very subtle. We're not a being or a self with some scars. We are our some scars. This is the way we and the universe, of which we're kind of the same thing. I'm in my room. That's my universe at that moment. Each of us expresses, we're an expression of divinity the way we are because of our some scars. Our some scars are what generate us. As a person progresses and then embarks on the spiritual path, the guru should be able to know where that person is at. My poor friend in the kirtan group was no way was able to perceive inwardly where people were at spiritually. Only a guru can do that. When he knows where a, people, a person is at, then he won't select a mantra. He'll create a sound. When I give you a mantra, it's not selected. To select a mantra means that there exists just a list from which you select a mantra to initiate somebody with. And that's not the right process. Mantras do not fall in the realm of a mechanical science. It's not a mathematical science in which two to two makes four and four and four makes eight. He's saying that because there's traditional practices where if you're at a certain place in your life, like you just got married and started a family, or you just got your first big job, or you're a little child, or if you're an older person beginning spiritual practices, you're given particular mantras. And he's saying that's not as simple as just assigning person, you know, mantras on a mechanical basis like that. It's rather an art. It's an art form in which the artist or the poet can attune him or herself to his higher self and to the universe. In other words, the superconscious level to the higher self, the superconscious level, or to the universe. Because of his highly developed intuition and his purity in being a channel, 
He can conceive of the very subtlest vibrations that permeate a person and of which that person is made from its most subtle to its grosser and grosser ramifications until the person reaches the physical body. This is what I was meditating on today. And I, maybe I'll read a little bit more and I might give a, some insights into what that means. Because we've all heard things like this, that we are comprised or composed all the way from the subtlest vibration that permeates that person of which the person is made, we're made of vibrations, to the most subtle, to the grosser and grosser ramification until that person reaches the physical body. Now that's stuff we've heard before, but we should spend time trailing. He's describing that's how reality exists. What does he mean by that? Subtlest vibrations to the physical body. Okay, what does he mean by that? Quickly, here's my hand. It looks pretty solid, doesn't it? What is it really? Well, a quick and easy model for it is, it's made of, of chemicals, right? Water and blood and, and stuff, and they're made out of phosphorus and carbon and oxygen, and right? hydrogen, that's what we're told by the scientists. Those are made out of atoms and molecules. Atoms and molecules are made out of what they call atomic particles. Mm -hmm. Atomic particles are basically made out of energy. What is energy? It's frequencies, it's vibrations, it's light. I look at this hand, it's made out of colored light. It's made out of vibrations. It's made out of energy. Sure looks solid. Here's where the mystery deepens. How do I know it's a hand? Because fundamentally, it's a conceptual process in what I think of as my brain. How did that conceptual process, how did handness appear in my brain? The interaction of all these chemicals in the brain, right? The electrical impulses in the brain. What are all those electrical chemical impulses in the brain out of the molecules? What are atoms and molecules? They're fundamentally light vibrations. How can my picture in my brain of a hand show up in my mind and I live in this world like a room that's just made out of colored light? How does that happen? That's consciousness. What's consciousness? Consciousness is divinity. It's intense. When I initiate somebody into a mantra practice, I focus on the photograph, the physiology of the person. Now, first, that sounds like bullshit. How can you just concentrate on your picture? Well, guess what? I'm concentrating. When I see another person, you're just seeing a picture. You're seeing something in your mind. What's the difference? So if somebody tells you their whole life history, do you know them? No, of course you don't. You just know what you appears in consciousness. Of course, we arrive can use a picture. What's the difference? When I focus on a photograph, the physiology of that person, the person I both regress from the physical self to the subtlest value of that person, the energetic, let's just say the energetic expression of that person, the image, how that person presents itself in the vast spectrum of consciousness. In that meditative state, through the mercy and the grace of God, I go to the level where that person is. Very important. As an analogy, if a person is traveling from London while going through various cities, then how does he determine how far away he is from Edinburgh? From the milestone that he's at. The entire circumference from London to Edinburgh must be taken into account and then focused on the point where he is standing. In other words, you gotta see the whole picture and then know where an individual person is manifesting inside or as part of that whole picture, the whole map of consciousness. If you're lost on the road at a certain town, let's say Leeds, at the corner of a certain street and you want to reach Liverpool, you have to phone up somebody to ask which route you must take. You can only start from where you are and not from an unknown place. When you phone somebody at the first question, they'll ask you, where are you? And from that point, they will direct you to your destination. Why is this unusual? Because Guru Raj, we're all consciousness and... We are the individualized personification of divinity in this form, in this place, right now. That's quite different than the approach of, let's say, the Buddhists, who say, oh, what kind of practice are you going to do? I think you're going to do a Tara practice. You should recite this mantra. 
how does that express your individuality? How does that express the unique expression of Torah that you actually are? It's like you have to subsume yourself into Torah. Guruaj is really summoning up, says, you are divine. It doesn't mean that you're those bland, homogenized man-aids of divinity. No, your particular expression is a function of divinity. Your particular stage, what you are, your uniqueness. He really respects that. A person's mantra represents his sum totality. To use a stupid analogy, if there were some mechanical means by which a person's mind, body, and spirit could be melted down into a sound value, then the mantra within your range would be the sound that would be heard. So after progressing on the path, what happens in mantra meditation is that you become the mantra. And by becoming the mantra, you're becoming one with your real self. When you become one with your real self, then you can watch the ego at play with its ups and downs, its personality quirks and all those things. But what you experience is you, excuse me, I added something with that, you remain untouched. It's because you're established in self, the true self. You're established in divinity. You don't identify with the personality and all its troubles anymore. You shine that way, that shows up, like everything else shows up. It's just stuff that shows up in experience. But you don't identify with that. You identify with the source of that. Very different. And that is freedom. That's liberation. That's self-realization. That's salvation. In which you, in recognizing your real self, are able to live in this world that has the witness, just an observer of what's happening, the play of divinity. So mantra meditation is something very important. Uh, I'm trying to think of today, another way of getting this. And I've gone back to painting, which I love. And I have all my little color paints. And you guys can figure out if you take blue paint and you take yellow paint and you mix blue paint and yellow paint together, blue paint and yellow paint are very distinct. You put them together, they make green paint. Is yellow and blue inside the green paint? Nope, it's green paint. You can't divide it back up into yellow and blue. That's what we are. Our particular colors are all of these samskaras, all these different vibrations. They come through just like us, and we are the green paint. We are a particular shade and tone of green, depending on all of our vibrational frequencies that have come together. It's kind of cool. On one hand, we're comprised of different colored paints. On the other hand, we are a particular color, okay, that's special to us. As you get more established in your mantra, your mantra will reach a finer and finer level until it becomes just an impulse, the impulse of divinity. My guru gave me a mantra that's 13 syllables in length, and with years of practice and various other practices, I now experience all 13 level syllables simultaneously as one impulse. Even as I am sitting here speaking to you, I'm totally aware and conscious of that impulse within me. That is as far as we can reach while we're still in body. I puzzled what he meant by that. That is as far as we can reach while we're still embodied. But once that impulse has been reached and we discard this body, then that impulse merges away in the universe, a universal impulse into that absolute realm. We merge away. And I'm not quite sure all that he means by that, because I understand it in some sense, our some scarred body our karmic vehicle, reassembles itself into another expression of dream in another life. But he's talking about maybe just, it's like, yeah, who knows. Yet because of the impulse being there, man can say he experiences the relative as well as the absolute, the grosser workings of the relative as well as the finest impulse of the absolute. In this range of the relative, the mind and body are only the grosser manifestation of the mind. 
It's a continuum. He's saying that we can experience the superconscious level of the mind. Out of which, within which, the relative expression of experience manifests continually. And by the way, uh, I assume all you guys, when you meditate now, you meditate below the neck. I assume most of you. Above the neck meditation is Omani Pami Home, Omani Pami Home. Oh, Omani Pami Home, what does that mean? It means the jewel in the heart of the lotus. Yes, Omani Pami Home, Omani Pami Home. Okay. Mantra meditation, as he says, as you get more experience with the mantra, you experience it more and more as part of your nervous system. And like right now, without getting too mysterious about it, I'm feeling the presence of the mantra right in here. Usually it shows up towards the base in my personal predicament, okay? It tends to show up lower down in the chakras, Muladhara or Swadhisthana, that's personal to me. Sometimes it manifests in Anha. Sometimes it manifests in other parts. In other words, it's part of the chakric system, which is just another phrase, a fancy word for our energy, how we express ourselves energetically. Okay? That's a big topic, so I'm not going to spend that much time on it. In the mind, we have three categories. The conscious mind, the subconscious mind with all its various layers, and the superconscious mind. All of these layers are taken into consideration when he's giving you a mantra. He can sense all of those layers functioning in totality in each one of us. The superconscious level of the mind, being nearest to the absolute, reflects the light most clearly. I think, I'm pretty sure he means by the superconscious level of the mind, that's the thing which basically senses or is aware of the range, everything is ranges of frequencies. Okay, the super level, it's least influenced by the personality. It's closest to uh, what he calls in other places the personal God, but it also, it's the part of our, um, uh, uh, it's the, the self or awareness, the way Rupert Spira talks about it. All right, it's the, the Buddha mind. The, super, the subconscious mind contains all of some scars on the impressions. It's Ankara. Is that right? Can't take it. No, it's the I self, excuse me. It's um, Alaya Vidyana for Marian. Okay, the, the, uh, the Alaya Vidyana, it's the part that contains all of the impressions, the, the stuff out of which this energetic expression shows up. We show up this way because of our samskaric body. These impressions do not allow the light of the superconscious to shine totally clearly into the conscious mind because we're filled with our thoughts and our projections and our emotions and our considerations. So we don't sense the underlying unity of all of that. Through meditation, we're forming a connection, a direct line from the superconscious to the conscious mind so that the conscious mind becomes flooded. We become more aware. What happens when we do mantra meditation is that we start on a conscious level. Through this connection, we go through the various layers of the subconscious mind to reach the superconscious layer of the mind in which that purity of light is brought back. And that's Guraj's explanation for how meditation works, that the light of what Rupert Spiro might call awareness illuminates all of our personality quirks, what we, we falsely identify, or what we identified with the false self, our personality, our opinions, our beliefs, and this perceptual world, which is just a projection of ourselves. It's like if you spend half an hour in a perfume factory, you come back smelling like perfume. So the purpose here is to be able to combine the superconscious, the subconscious, and the conscious mind into a oneness. When you have this link, this connectedness, then that's called integration. Integration is when all three aspects of the mind are able to function harmoniously. And then the mind functions harmoniously, then the body, which is just the grosser aspect, a grosser step from the conscious mind, also becomes ones with it. That's the purpose of mantra meditation. 
In other words, that's what he means by self-realization. That the body, what we could call the unconscious, the, the, the superconscious, the awareness level of the mind, and the conscious level of the mind, which, as my teach would say, the conscious level of the mind is being heavily influenced. Some would say over 90% by your unconscious fixations, beliefs, habits, and addictions. All of that becomes experienced as a totality. There's no separation. Okay, it's unity consciousness. So I never select a mantra. Instead, I create a mantra. All the essences are there because the sound is eternal. We know that the primordial or the primal manifestation was nothing but sound. We all know how the scriptures say, first there was the word and the word was with God and the word is God. That's from John in the gospels. We all know that God being abstract, okay, by his own nature concretizes himself to make what we call the universe. Um, Maybe, I hope you guys all can grok that. We all know that God being abstract, it's even to call it energy is concretizing it already, or potential, or just beingness, isness. We know that God being abstract, but by its own nature, concretizes himself to make what we call the universe. The only criticism I make of garage is it implies that God has a will. No, it's... You can't separate the manifester and the manifestation. It's just, well, it's like the flower, which does not create fragrance. It's not an effort of will that a flower creates fragrance. By its own nature, it gives off fragrance. That's what flowers do. It's just part of being a flower. This is what God does. What God is, is this. We all get that, I think. In the same way, fire doesn't create heat, but it's just the nature of fire to give off heat. So we know that the physical body, and we know a bit about the conscious mind. We may only think we know about it, but we nevertheless are quite aware of the conscious mind. But then there are the various layers of the subconscious mind. Psychologists up to now have been only able to reach layer one and layer two. When Gorosh was writing back, back in the 80s, they didn't realize something that you might have read, I've read recently, that they now realize that what we think, what we say, what we do, far, way before it emerges in the conscious awareness, it's actually in the unconscious. It shows up, it's an impulse in the unconscious. They can actually register, a th a, they hook you up with wires, they sense the energy from the part of the brain which is gonna form the thought, they sense that before it becomes a conscious thought. In other words, you're not in control of this process at all. The whole range of the superconscious is still unknown to psychologists. Awareness, the isness of things, which you can experience directly, the isness of things. Since they've only gone beyond the surface of the conscious mind and into a small aspect of the subconscious mind. Within the layers of the subconscious mind are the impressions, the samskaras, that manifest themselves. Because these impressions can't remain stagnant, impressions themselves are always in motion. To find expression, these impressions find expression in the conscious mind. And from the conscious mind, they find expressions in the physical body. All right. Boy, I've got to keep going here, but there's a lot to say about that. How the subconscious, the conscious mind, and the physical expression of this body are closely linked. So take an obvious example. Uh, everybody used to yell at you when you were a kid for whatever reason. You experience a lot of fear in your conscious mind, and this influences and sort of physiological effects in your body. Fearfulness gets lodged. They're all a continuum. Okay. That's the origin of all the diseases of the physical body. Now, today science has discovered that practically all ailments originate from the mind. They originate from the abstract value of the subconscious mind and translate themselves psychosomatically into the physical. 
What we do in meditation is to form a channel from the conscious level of the mind to the superconscious. We become much more aware, in other words. The area that is closest to the absolute, it must not be forgotten that the absolute permeates all of this. But the absolute is expressed best at the superconscious level, at its brightest. As it goes through the subconscious layers and comes to the conscious layer, it's colored by the impressions of the samskaras that are contained there. Our individual psychological experiences are colored, okay, by our unconscious contents. What is that that is experiencing everything? What is experience itself is consciousness the energy of consciousness itself, the awareness, the process of becoming. What is that which is aware? It's awareness itself. What is it aware of? Our personality, our body, and the subjective world. Okay? One is the superconscious level. One is the conscious or relative level. <coughs> When it comes to the creation of a mantra, I go into meditation and I tap into that range at which that person is vibrating. In the whole complex of the mind, there are 12 wavelengths that the seers, the rishis, have proven. There's nothing to do with the 12 signs of the zodiac, but there are 12 ranges or levels or wavelengths in the mind itself. I can't find any reference to what, what tradition he's referring to there. Okay, I even asked a, a friend of mine who's an, a scholar of this stuff, and he wasn't familiar with where he got this. One person might be there, another person might be there, and another person might be there. So in deep meditation, while focusing on this person's photograph at the physical level, I regress and I find the vibration to see where he's at. Let's say this person's at a certain place according to his evolution. Through a deep meditation, from the physical level, I will focus on exactly where that person is standing in his or her stage of evolution. This is a whole range, a total range, because all the various layers and sections are interpenetrating. Okay? It's not like we separate from divinity as we become ourselves. We're always expressions of divinity. The totality is always there. We are the personalized coloration of the totality. We're not a part of divinity. We are like, we're a particularized expression of, of consciousness. We're not fragments of anything. This is a total range because all of the various layers and sections are interpenetrating. It's not quite correct to speak of them as layers or sections because they're superimposed on each other. Each one has a definite connection to the other layers. They're, um, you know, one's higher because the other one's lower. They all are necessary to define one another. The green color paint is green because it's not blue or yellow. It's a continuum. All these hues are contrasting. They're all aspects of color. And all together, they make, you know, all the colors. They make the symphony. They make the painting. When I reach a person at a particular stage in his totality and evolution, he's permeated by the absolute connected to the superconscious and all the other layers. He's at his most vibrant self, his total self at that point. A sound is heard in the meditation that represents that person. But this sound is heard in a different dimension at a very subtle level. My job is to bring that subtle level from a different dimension into this physical level so that the sound can be made speakable and audible. I realize he and other people, and for us, it's very hard to call these things vibrations because when we think of vibrations, we think of you know, sound vibrations, or we speak of something we feel, and he's not quite, I was using the analogies of colors, it's not quite, we could use the analogies of energies, but all those things are, are things, we, our conscious mind can't help but find, they're too specific, they're too limited, all right, they're, they're like poetic utterances. He's talking about, he says, it's not something he necessarily hears, even inwardly, Okay, it's something else, which I'm not a guru, so. 
Within the 12 wavelengths, that is the range of the entirety of the mind, we now have reached this person's level. The sound is heard here, but in a different dimension, because in the depths of meditation, you're in a totally different dimension. It's far beyond the physical and the conscious. It isn't like, sound, you know, like ordinary sound or even ordinary vibrations. It's not what he's... The 12 wavelengths are a vast range that encompasses everything that at the center is vibrating. In that meditative state, having reached the center of that person where he's at, my job is to create the syllables that I can actually speak and utter. In the whole range of vibrations, and depending upon many factors and picking it out of the groove at that moment, I might conceive of it, for example, as asayum, on the conscious level. But I might go into that same meditation on that same person a few weeks later, and I interpret it through the mechanisms of the conscious mind as Ramarim, also through the conscious level. So why is there this difference? He's saying he could, at different times when he tunes in, you could come up with a slightly different mantra. This was surprising to me. So it's so like, what's the difference? Why aren't they just arbitrary? <clears throat> he goes on, he says, a person that does not know the process might see that three weeks ago you gave me asayim, and three, le three weeks later, this happens very seldom, he says it happens very seldom, you might give me ra 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 -ri. Why is this? Well, the reason is that the conscious level of the mind and the conditioning of the conscious level of the mind has to be taken into consideration. But the most important factor is that it comes from the same range, so there can be no conflict whatsoever. For example, you can take a drumstick from a cooked chicken, or you can put it in, point to it in your stomach, but it's still chicken. Now, I've been thinking a lot about what this, I'm not sure what it means. Maybe it has something to do, like, I can actually mix almost exactly the same green on my palate using a variety of different pigments. I can put them together and come up with the same green. You know, this range of pigments over here, this particular blue, this particular yellow over here makes one green, another blue and another yellow over here makes another green, but they can look almost the same. Can't look exactly the same, but almost the same. I think Guru Aj is trying to get at some similar process here. <coughs> With many of the systems in which mantras are chosen arbitrarily, you might be on this frequency, on this bandwidth, but the person giving the mantra does not know you and is not able to reach you where you are, so that he or she might choose just any old sound at random. That might sound might actually be from a very different frequency that does not work on your frequency. That's how all these emotional problems begin. That's how all the stress begins. From the thousands of people we have initiated, there's never been a single complaint concerning their mantras because they are harmonious and beneficial to them. He's saying the guru, the, the mantra represents our totality. Right now, we consciously identify, not with our totality, but with fragmented aspects of ourselves, with our thoughts or emotions, our beliefs, our physical selves. We identify not with the totality. The mantra is the totality of what we are, our particular expression, which divinity has shown up as us. We are that particular shade of green. All right, and he's talking about mantra. This mantra meditation makes us experience ourselves as the totality of all of these frequencies working together. It's important to remember that the proper range and wavelength on the radio of the mind has to be connect, contacted and connected with. Otherwise, you can't have your proper mantra. You're just playing with fire. Otherwise, why not just pick up any old book and pick out any old mantra you want? It's then just a game of chance. This is wrong because it can harm people. And this has happened. I've been in ashrams in America with a group of us, and you'd be surprised at the things that were going on there, the shouting and the screaming. He's talking about Rajneesh's ashram. ashram. Okay, just between you and us, and if you want to find out more about Rajneesh, well, you have the internet, and it was a lot of fun. I didn't do the Rajneesh, but I mean, it was, there's even a movie made about how Rajneesh his spiritual community just went haywire. We watched, my, Laura and I watched a, a bunch of it. That's because they're all working on vibrations, but they were not conducive to them. So what are we actually? But we're nothing but vibrations, congealed vibrations. 
and vibrations can exist in many forms. It's like water. When vapor becomes condensed, it becomes water. When it's further condensed, it becomes a solid block of ice. And yet the vibration is the same vibration is existent. The H2O is always there, but it's just modified according to the circumstances with which that vibration is involved, the temperature. I thought that was remarkable. We can change and we, as our person, we get, we, you know, we're young, we get mature, we get old, you know, our body changes, our thoughts certainly change, our opinions change, and yet our vibration can stay constant. There's nothing constant in this physical self or this mental self changes all the time. And our emotional selves, which change minute by minute by minute. And our samskaras change constantly too. What stays constant? Guruaj is saying our vibrational level stays constant. If that vibration is subject to heat, the H2O will be vapor, but it can become liquid or become frozen into a block of ice. Now, the reason I just said that we remain constant is vibrations, but how do we evolve in that case? Well, actually, I'm not so sure, but he goes on to it a little bit. There was a controversy within organization about using the preparatory mantra, Guru Ananda, or just Ananda. Okay, now this is very interesting. It's the thought of, of well, I'll read it. At first, I thought, just let them do what they want. Just let them play. It's just like how you might allow children to play, and then you can stop them from going beyond the fence, for example, where they might get hurt. They can play within the fence, and it will be all right. But when I thought about it later, I found that there were deep psychological implications to it. It's a subtle way of drawing the attention of the chela away from the guru, from the source, from the purity. It's, it's deciding your own spiritual practices. It's like trying to, uh, you know, play doctor to yourself, which we're all tempted to do. This is totally against our principle, as there has to be a bond between the guru and the chela, and not something that does not create that bond. There is a value in sound. Uh, in India, for example, there once existed a musician named Kansan, who by singing a certain raga could produce fire, and by singing another he could produce rain. Science has proved that if you play a violin at a certain pitch, you will crack all the windows. Everything is composed of vibrations. Vibration has motion because vibration is motion. Wherever there is motion, it has to produce sound. A window is vibration, and it's vibration, and it's vibrating there as it is. There are millions of atoms and molecules swirling around in that pane of glass, and this motion is producing a subtle sound in the pane of glass. If you use your violin and tune it in such a way that it corresponds and overpowers those vibrations, then the glass will be shattered. Everything being vibration and the whole human composition being vibration, it's very important to use a mantric formula, if you want to call it that, within the range of where one is. It's giving a long explanation how you can mess yourself up if you try to fiddle around with your mantra, okay, change it, or just decide you know you want to choose your own mantra have somebody choose it for you who's not experienced in figuring out how mantras work that's not the only thing that happens when a person's initiated he or she is not initiated when the full counselor teaches the mantra that person is initiated at the time when i conceive of his or her mantra we have hundreds he makes some connection with you we have had hundreds of cases in which a new meditator reports, I'm still in the prep technique, but I feel something. I can't explain it, but I, I feel something and something's happened. Something has happened. Well, this opinion depends on a person's awareness and sensitivity to pick it up. So the person is initiated at the time when the mantra is conceived. Of course, that person is not sensitive enough to pick up the rest of it directly and telepathically. So we use the medium of trained teachers to show the techniques of how to use the mantra in other practices. But that's only 30%. The other 70% depends upon the spiritual force that is sent out with that mantra. In that state, I am not me. I am not the man with all his faults and frailties, a human being like you and everyone else. 
in that state, I am not that. I am in total communion, and I am someone else totally different. And that's where the spiritual force arises. Uh, a lot of it, so some of us at this point just have total faith and say, okay, good, sure, I accept that. Some of us, like me, wonder, wow, is that true? All I can tell you is this, contemporary spirituality is now anti-guru because everybody's worried about being ripped off or sexually abused or something by a guru. So gurus are very suspect now. Let's just say in all the great tra traditional spiritual disciplines like Buddhism, which I spent a long time with, it was very important. The initiation of process initiated with your guru and the connection with the guru was very important. Your Vajra guru was extremely important. In the Christian tradition, your connection with Christ or with the Pope, if you happen to be a Catholic, is very important, very deeply significant, not to be messed with. In the Christian tradition, it's about Jesus. It's about the authority of Jesus. Uh, it's not about you just making it up yourself. So, uh, I'm interested that contemporary forms of, of spiritual practice and meditation have abandoned this notion of what it means to be initiated by a guru. What does it mean to have the contact from the guru or guru shakti, which is what he's talking about. And they say you don't really need a guru or gurus are all fake or, uh, you know, you, you can just do it on your own. I'm curious about that. It certainly wasn't Guru Raja's tradition. Okay. You, you know. Make up your, we can make up our own minds about it because we're all Americans and so far we supposedly have freedom of choice. I don't think we do actually. I think we're, we're products of the unconscious mind. Okay, I think we're just listening to our own opinions and beliefs. But a lot of people think they're free. So the creation of that sound is not a selection, it's creation. It's an art. That's why people sometimes get the form so late. Is uh, the meditation forms back from him. Until I can contact that person at that level, I shall not initiate a mantra. It would be wrong, and that's what's worth waiting for. And what's worth having is worth waiting for. This is so important because the entirety of yourself depends upon that very sound vibration, which is eternal and will go on from life to life. It will always follow you. You are your vibration. And this is a good little picture for me of what incarnation might be about. We go into, we die. Okay. We reform. I'm convinced about reincarnation, but how does the mechanism takes place? And he's talking about the energetic impulse. Okay. And I could go on more about it, but I have to keep using analogies. Let's stick to the way his, he's just calling it vibration. Even in the next life, you'll find yourself being reinitiated within the same range that you are in, unless you've transcended it or gone beyond that range. I'm not quite sure, I'm not an expert on this, so I don't know if he's meaning that within this present incarnation, our vibration can subtly change, or if that happens in between lives, I don't know, but let's just say, you tend to, you know, the same energetic manifestation, some scaric body, subtle body, they also cause karmic body, causal body, all synonyms. Okay, or what? That's in the bardo, in the intermediate state. That's where the new body is generated out of the body. The body proceeds out of these vibrational things. This body is vibrational stuff. Okay, I went through the whole thing of our hand is just colored light that we're looking at. Actually, it's just mind. We're looking at mind, chitta, mind stuff. Okay, there is no physical hand out there in the way that our mind likes to tell us is. It's just like those people on the TV. They aren't real. Okay, the actors and actresses aren't even real. Okay, that movie you're watching, it's just colored light. There's nothing there. I don't know how many people have understood that physical bonds can be broken. Mental bonds of the conscious mind can be broken. But the spiritual bond can never be broken. You might go away, for example, what you call a holiday. You might go for a holiday, but you must come back home again. If not in this life, then in the next life is fine too. After all, what is time? 
we measure it linearly here, but in a different dimension, it's like going around the corner and coming in from another door. That's all it is. In the Bhagavad Gita, they have one section where Arjuna is very upset and talking to Krishna, to God, okay? Arjuna is the protagonist of the Bhagavad Gita. There's the dialogue between a, a, a spiritual seeker and God. And he said, listen, if I do all these spiritual practices in this life, but, you know, if I blow it, you know, and I, I, I goof up and, and, and really nothing much happens, I don't really get much realization. Is it all just wasted? And, and Krishna basically says, no, Arjuna, he says, nothing's ever wasted. You'll pick it up next life, life after life after life. You reconnect with this source. You reconnect with what he called Guru, the voice of the divine. Huh. So one has to come very clever and very careful in how one gets initiated. What sound is given and how harmonious is it? Can it be a layman, a beginner, really judge this for himself? If he could, you could pick up any book and find your mantra. That's why gurus, the real gurus, not bogus so-called gurus, are necessary. A guru is apart from the personality. Very important to understand this. We can use many examples. Jesus is not different than the Christ. Gotama is different from the Buddha. Buddha means the awakened one. Even you are not the you that you think you are. You're someone else than just this physical body and this little conscious mind. You have that inner stability. The only difference between you and me, meaning the guru, I have traveled the path and can cognize it. In other words, he fully can experience it on a conscious level. Guraj is integrated with the superconscious, total awareness, the subconscious, all of samskara body, and the conscious expression. They're all accessible. There's no difference, there's no difference at all. So this is how the mantra is created, and that's why we say to keep that mantra to yourself. Don't discuss it or it'll lose its momentum. There are those organizations that tell you you must not repeat their mantra to others. It's only because they have a list of 16 mantras. And at the University of Cape Town, there's one young man who was sitting in the canteen having lunch with some of the others of the same age group. And somehow he let slip his mantra. I think it was Ingo or Ringo or something. And they all stood up and said, but that's my mantra too. Okay, what is age? And they were giving out mantras according to age and sex and, and background. What does age and sex have to do with your vibration? Nothing at all. It's something unique to you. And the sound that is given to you is in within the ranges of where you are. The adept, the one that knows, is the one who has gone through this path and is the one who's been trained that knows how many lifetimes has this training been gone? Who knows? The test is this. Well, will it benefit you or not? Judge the tree by its fruit. Is the fruit good? Is it helping me in some way? Has it smoothed things out for me? Is it teaching me something in some way? Am I growing by it? That's the criteria of how valid this is, because this is the subject that can only really be understood by the adept, meaning the person, the master. The explanation I've given is only about the surface because you can't explain the subtle vibration there. You can't even speak it out loud. I have to bring it down to be able to hear it and speak it but it's important that the sound is given in the range of where you are. I've got just a couple more paragraphs. It's only five after six, so I'm gonna read the last little bit for those who are still there, and I hope you are. <clears throat> Anybody who's hip to a lot of things, spiritual scene, a lot of what Guraj is saying, I think is, is very uh, much more um, consequential much more fully expressed than a lot of the stuff I was reading on the internet today, which tended to become from particular points of view or particular belief systems. And uh, I find this uh, very provocative. But again, it's, it's very different than what other people talk about with mantras. For example, there's people that say that mantras should always contain the name of the divine in it. Guru says nothing at all about that. You don't need the, the name of Siva or Ram or something. It mentions that, not at all. Other people say it must have the bija sound syllables. There's a series of vowel sounds that represent, they call seed, bija, seed syllables, and that they must be comprised of bija, seed syllables. 
says nothing about stuff like that. And there's a whole enormously complicated bunch of Indian stuff about how mantras are supposed to be used and constructed. That, uh, you know, if you're a Hindu, good for you. You know, believe in that stuff. But Guru Raj is not referring to that stuff at all. It's remarkable, actually. There are no universal mantras. Oh, and there's people that talk about the mantras that are a lot, they're, they're expressions of different energy systems and the chakras. I refer to something like that a little bit, that you, you know, that you uh, work with your body when you're, you're reciting mantra. But Guru Raj is not talking about he didn't mention any of that stuff. Although, uh, before I say he didn't think it, all of our, back in the day, we were given specific um, um, chakra practices. I was, for example, all of the tools of focus on certain kinds of chakras and certain kinds of abilities. So he was aware of all that. He just didn't want to make it a Hindu practice and make it the universal aspect. There are no universal mantras. Satam Am uh, Nama Shivayam, you have these organizations that use these mantras. That's what I was just talking about. I could name you many more, and that's why they're not really successful. I know one organization in America, Swami Muktananda's, for example, he was three, four printed mantras on a whole stack of cards. And when somebody said, give me a mantra, he just handed them a card. While he was bopping, his head, bopping people on the head with feathers, he was initiating them. He was having a conversation with somebody else. It's been a nice day-to-day -day card pop. This doesn't lead you to your inner self. Your inner self is something unique and is very, very personal and very deep. It has to be approached in a totally systematic and proper manner to be able to reach oneself. If you talk of universal mantras, then you can use one so-called universal mantra today and another one tomorrow and the next day still another one. Where is the real force involved? Now that's interesting, because a lot of us, me too, I've gone through periods where I used, you know, one mantra for a couple of weeks and switch other ones and stuff like that. But he's then he refers to that shakti, that spiritual force, which he said when he comes up with your mantra, when he initiate, that's when you're initiated. When he comes up with your mantra, and when he gives the mantra, or when the through the through the uh, full the teacher, the prep teacher gives you your mantra, the spiritual force, the shakti from your guru is, is given to you. And you can disagree or agree with that. He's simply saying those people that use change mantras all the time, he says you don't have that spiritual force behind it. And by the way, the Tibetan system also doesn't. It says when you are given the abhisheka, the, the, the initiation, it's called an abhisheka, the empowerment of a particular mantra, a particular practice, uh, you're obligated to keep doing it. Okay. Otherwise, nothing at all happens, or it might even harm you. Where is the real force that's involved? When one mantra is used by millions of people, the value is diffused and it doesn't have the required effect. Okay, maybe. What about own? But I don't know. Our system is a very, very unique system. It's only one in the world. It is coming about through very, very deep study not only by me, but by my guru and in consultation with various master yogis who won't even show their faces to the world. They stay in their caves. That's all. We're very fortunate, and I am very fortunate, to be given this privilege to be able to intuitively dive deeply into the inner being of a person and come up with the essence of the sound that is totally appropriate to that person. <clears throat> I think that's remarkable. That's where he claims that he's unique in this. And as I said, I can't find other references to other people talking about it in this way at all. You can make of that what you will. After all, the tool of the mantra is only 30%. It's the spiritual force behind it that forms 70% of it, the guru power. There are organizations that practically run a mantra market. I know of an organization which a young lady came to visit. She came in by one door, and at the desk she paid $120 or something got shoved into a cubicle, was given the mantra, and went out by the other door. This is a mantra market, and I want those people who can persevere to reach a stage where even your mantra won't be required. Once that impulse becomes such an integral part of yourself, then you become the mantra. And when you become the mantra, you know your real self. And in that knowingness of your real self, you are a living mantra. You don't even need to repeat it. 
the mantra repeats itself. Your whole being, every cell of your body repeats and echoes that impulse 24 hours of the day. That's the goal. That is wonderful. It's 10 after now. Quickly, I remember Ramakrishna literature, and you know, I'm very close to Ramakrishna. Uh, he had a statement, and he's not a lightweight, where he said, uh, the scripture, okay, the mantra, and the individual devotee, or the devotee, you know, divinity, and the scripture are exactly the same. Guruaj is talking about reaching a level of experience where you experience totality of consciousness, in which case you experience yourself as the mantra, totality of consciousness, which is just vibration. It's just... Uh, and these are words for things, and we're all uh, spiritual practitioners. It's very important for us not to get stuck at the level of belief or concept. These are uh, things to be discovered in our spiritual practices and grow deeper and deeper and deeper over the years uh, where we leave our opinions, our conscious mind behind and delve into our meditational practices. And in our meditation, we let the conscious mind alone. We let it play. The mantra is an impulse on some level. Remember, we only give a certain amount of percentage of attention to the mantra. You don't have to focus on it and grip like a death grip. You just let it play. Okay? And you leave the mind, the awareness to expand. Let the awareness expand. So, goody. So let me see now uh, if I can open it up. Gallery view. And let's see if I can manage participants. And unmute all. Okay, I think we're unmuted. Good job. All right. Way to go. I'm a so, it was great. Hey, well, thank you. This is deep. Uh, one thing to take away is Guru Rai says he's the only person who's doing this. I don't know. I just, I've never heard of a mantra being discussed this way before. And I've heard many discussions of mantra. Never heard it. The other thing is we use the mantra system. It's central to AMS. And I think that's worth considering because guess what? That even the Tibetan Buddhists are getting rid of their gurus and getting rid of this mantra tradition. You know, they'll use, uh, uh, Vajra initiations, where you're given a particular deity, a particular set of mantras, a particular set of practices. Not a lot of the Tibetan Buddhists are doing that anymore, because you know what, we're Americans, and you know, it's not right, you know, I want to do it my own way. Goraj is saying that's not what it's about. He's saying you need somebody like, uh, someone on a, a, a guru to help you with this. And a lot of us, I'm, I'm speaking for myself, a lot of us, because of our pride and our prejudices and our you know, don't you dare mess with my life, you know. We want to hold on to our own prejudices. And we're always saying that's not what it's about. Let's go. <clears throat> Anybody else? No, just thank you, Jeff. So beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank what you. should I'm interested in talking about this is where Guru Raj is very different than many spiritual practices. And I've also tonight, I made it clear that he's not talking about this, I call it PC, politically correct awareness talk, which is what most of the current spiritual circles are talking about. And they'd like to talk about it because it doesn't offend anybody. Hmm. You know, even the Christians will go along with it. You say, oh, but what about Christ? Is Christ is just awareness. Really? Yeah. You, your savior is awareness. Now, a good Christian would say, bullshit. You develop a personal relationship with your personal Savior, and that's Christ. And I respect that. That's their guru. Good. You know, that's their guru. And it isn't some bullshit generic awareness. You know, it's Christ. You know, your, Buddha, your guru is your guru. Okay? Yeah. Hey, does it, what, do, what do people want to hear about next time? What's a good topic? Hmm. 
Krishna? Sure. Always. Yeah. <laughs> Krishna's gotten really unfashionable, so I don't mind. Oh, let's have dive. Have you done Krishna's smile? Have I done Krishna's? That's my favorite sad sign. So I always feel like I've done Krishna's smile so many times. You've done it on this online, this discussion? No, but I mean, I, I've talked about it in the past so many times. That's my favorite sad sign. Well, yeah, that'll be nice. How about love? Yes, of course. Yes. How about physical love? Why not? Sure. Because Guruaj has some provocative teachings about that, which I, I think is funny. Well, I'll find something good. Thank you very much. I hope we get to the end of the month, and I'll try to find a good good time for us to go. Thank you so much for sharing in this. Thank you, beloveds. Thank you. We're all gonna be. Thank you. See you next time, beloveds. Bye, bye, beloveds. Bye, bye beloveds. Bye, bye. Thank you, Jeff. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Yeah. I think I just click it in. There we go. Okay. <laughs>